Good afternoon and welcome to MOS Live for our virtual planetarium, The Sky Tonight. My name is Karen. I'm one of the many educators here at the Museum of Science. So excited to see you guys here for our planetarium show today. My job today will be to act as your moderator, which just means I will be keeping an eye out on the chat, or sorry, the Q&A box, looking for any of your questions or your comments or your observations, and I will pass them along to our lead educator as well as everybody else in attendance today. If you are here on Zoom, you can click the Q&A button and type in those questions and comments. If you are watching us on Facebook or YouTube Live, uh, we so appreciate you are here tuning in, but we cannot build questions or comments from those platforms. And lastly, if you are looking for captioning, you can click the CC button and choose Show Subtitles. So I think with that, I will invite Talia to turn on her camera and introduce herself. Hi, everybody. As Karen said, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your presenter today, uh, telling you about some things that you're going to be able to find in the sky tonight and um, taking your observations and your questions. By the way, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. I do love answering questions about space. Um, so to help us out today, I'm using a program called Stellarium. It is a free open source software. You can use it on the internet or you can download it and use it on your computer. It can show you the night sky or the daytime sky as well. It can show you the sky from any time, any place on earth. Right now, I have it set for Boston, Massachusetts uh, tonight at 8.06 which you might think is kind of a weirdly random time, but I did that on purpose. I'm going to face this around. Right now we're facing south. You can see that red S marking south. I'm going to face this around towards the western sky. You can see where the sun went down right here. There's still a little bit of glow in the sky. And I'm gonna let time run forward actually at its normal pace because right after 8.06, this very, very bright thing appears on the Western horizon. And right now time is moving forward. I'm not fast forwarding time. Time is moving forward at its normal pace. And you can see this thing visibly moving across the sky. And what's weirder is it's not moving the way the sky usually moves. Things in the sky generally move, uh, rise in the east and move across the sky and set in the west. This is rising from the Western horizon. And you can see it is very, very, very bright. And again, I'm not fast forwarding time. This is how fast this thing is actually going to be moving across the sky. You can see it moving. Uh, so what do you think this is? And anytime I ask a question and you don't know the answer, you can always feel free to put question marks as your answer. Uh, because one of the most important things in science is to know what you don't know and to be willing to admit it. So what do you think this is? Well, you befuddled me at first. I may have figured it out. I have a guess in my head. We'll see what other guesses come in. But at first I thought you were just playing an April Fool's prank on us. Ah, um, no, that was yesterday. Yeah, making something rise backwards in the West. Um, we don't have any suggestions from our audience yet, but I will ask a proving question mm -hmm. and ask if this is a natural object or a human-made object. This is a human made object. So we'll see if you think that helped you make a guess, feel free to put that right into the Q&A. If not, I'm sure Talia will just tell us what we're looking at. Okay, I, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Still nothing, so All go right. ahead and tell us. Well, this is actually the third brightest oh, wait, wait. object. Wait, we got some guesses. It just, you know, was a little delayed. Uh, someone suggests a satellite and someone suggests the space station. Both correct because the space station is in fact a satellite of the earth. This is this very bright thing rising from the west just after eight o'clock is the International Space Station. And it is the third brightest object that appears in earth sky after the sun and the moon. So it is a very bright object. It is going to be visibly moving. It's going to be rising from the northwest at just after eight o'clock, what time exactly it's going to rise is going to depend on where you are. Um, but anywhere from like 8.05 to 8.10 for the Massachusetts area. 
um, you can watch it. And this is going to be a good ISS pass to try and catch because it's going to go really high into the sky. Sometimes it just barely clears the horizon and it's only above the horizon for like a minute. This one's going to be up above the horizon for about six minutes and it's going to get pretty high in the sky, about 60 degrees, which is about two thirds of the way. If you think of straight up as 90 degrees, this is gonna be about two thirds of the way to straight up. So I'll go Tanya, ahead and- I'm looking at your time and you started mm -hmm. it at 8.06. Now it's 9.20, no. No, it's- I'm reading that uh, backwards. I'm reading it like I'm in uh, Europe. <laughs> No, this is it's 8.09 right now. There we go. Because I was confused. I'm like, wait, it's been like an hour. Nope, it has been three minutes. Um, and I'll go ahead and fast forward time just so you can see exactly how high this is going to be. It is going to be in the northern half of the sky. What's the other thing that was moving over to the left? Uh, well, that was another satellite. So, okay. of course... The space station is the brightest satellite that we can see, but on any given night, you can go out and search for satellites. Just look for little dots that are moving around in the sky shortly after sunset, where the satellite is high enough that it is still catching the sun, um, but you down on Earth are in darkness. And that's what's happening here. That's why the ISS is so bright. It's high enough that the sun is still shining on it. Where we are on the ground, the sun has set, but the space station is still catching the sunlight. And that is why it is so bright. It's got a lot of very reflective surfaces on it, lots of big solar panels. But like I said, uh, you can go outside any given night and go satellite hunting whenever it's clear. Just sort of lie back, look up, and kind of let your eyes unfocus a little, like don't look at anything specific, and just look for things that are moving. They're usually pretty faint. The space station obviously is very bright. Most satellites are not. Sometimes they may even look like they're doing a slow flash and that's because the satellite is tumbling. Um, so I love to do that, especially on like clear summer nights, go satellite hunting. But definitely see if you can check out this uh, pass of the space station tonight. If you miss it, don't worry. Sat uh, ISS passes are, they don't happen every night, but they're not extremely rare events. So if you don't catch this one, you can catch a future one. And a good site to go to if you want to try and find um, when the next time the station is going to be visible from where you are. Uh, it's a website called Spot the Station, and it's great for finding out when your next ISS pass will be. They tend to be in the early evening, shortly after sunset, or in the early morning, shortly before sunrise, because the sun has to not be up where you are, but the space station has to be able to catch it. So you can see it got nice and high in the sky. I'll go ahead and fast forward time so that it will set. There we go. All right, so now we're at about 8.15. So the stars haven't changed very much because that wasn't actually that much time. Um, but we have a few interesting things that we can spot in the sky tonight. We still have our winter constellations up. They're still visible. Uh, if you've been catching any of our programs the last few weeks, you've probably been hearing about Orion the Hunter. For instance, he's right over here. You can spot his belt of three stars. Uh, if you're going to go spot Orion though, I highly recommend you do it soon. You might notice he is approaching that Western horizon. It's only 8.15. It's not that late in the evening. His time of year is about to end um, in just a few short weeks, which is fine because he's a winter constellation. The best time to look at Orion is the winter. And thankfully, it's no longer winter. I'm never usually, I'm usually never sad to see Orion leave because I'm usually done with winter at that point. But you can always look uh, in the western sky, the southwestern sky tonight for his shining belt of three stars right in a row. Um, above those stars are his two shoulders and below it are his knees. You might be able to see his arms. Those are much fainter, much harder to see. Uh, but you should definitely be able to see his belt, his shoulders, and his knees. And so another uh, so thing you can still spot in the sky right now is his opponent. You can see he's uh, he's got his one arm up like he's holding a weapon. He's got his other arm out like he's shielding himself. And that is because he is in the middle of a fight. Uh, and... He's fighting uh, this creature over here. The belt will point you in the right direction. 
to this sort of V shape in the stars. You can follow the direction that the belt points to this V shape anchored at one end by this very bright star, which is called Aldebaran. And um, this V shape is the face and head of Taurus the bull. And half of the bull is in the sky. I should say only half. So the V is the face and head, the two horns come up here. And what there is of a body is over here. It's not much of one. So Orion and Taurus are locked in battle. Um, and Orion may or may not have gotten a hit in because another thing you can use the belt to find, or you can just find it with your eyes, is this little star cluster right here. That is the Pleiades star cluster right there. It is on Taurus's shoulder. So sometimes it is considered to be a wound in his shoulder that Orion got a hit in, uh, in their fight. It's also called the Seven Sisters. And here's a fun thing um, that you might not tell just by looking at it. You can tell by looking at it that the Pleiades is what we would call a star cluster. It's a bunch of stars uh, tightly packed together. These are young stars that were all born at the same time from the same nebula. So they're all sort of siblings. Uh, and we can tell they're young because they're still tightly clustered together. Our sun would have once been born into a cluster like this. But these clusters over time, they sort of fall apart. The stars spread out, they move away from each other over the length of time that a star is alive. So the fact that these stars are still very tightly clustered can, is one of the things that tells us this is a very young group of stars. And actually, if you want to see a group of stars that is a cluster that is much looser coming apart, that's actually what Taurus's face is. That V shape, which doesn't look like the Pleiades. You can see the Pleiades here, they're nice and tight and close. This is the Hyades. So the Hyades, it's another star cluster. It is, um, like I said, it is the face and head of Taurus the bull, but it's actually another group of stars that were all born together, but this one is more spread out and it's even getting more spread out. There's actually been a few articles out this week about how fast the Hyades star cluster is coming apart. Fast being a relative term. Remember, whenever we talk about time in astronomy, fast could mean, you know, millions of years, <laughs> certainly thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. So this cluster is coming apart pretty quickly on astronomical time scales because these stars are older, they've been moving apart longer. Um, so they don't look as tightly clustered as the Pleiades, but it is also a star cluster. In fact, this one is the closest star cluster to Earth the face of Taurus the bull. And again, you can spot those two. They're in the Southwest sky. While you're there, right above them, right between Taurus's horns, actually. So above Orion's head, between Taurus's horns, you'll see another red object that is the planet Mars. Uh, and so I definitely think you guys should go check out that. That is gonna be vanishing from the sky, from the evening sky within a few weeks as well. Um, Mars, of course, named for the god of war in Greek and Roman mythology. It's also been named for blood, for fire, from cultures all over the world because it does actually look red in the sky. So you can find the brightish reddish object uh, above the heads of both Orion and Taurus and you will know you are looking at the planet Mars. Our next neighbor out, the uh, who just got a, a new rover on it in February. That rover is about to drop a little helicopter on the surface of Mars. Ingenuity is its name. And uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks, Ingenuity is going to become the first craft to fly through the air of another world. So that's a fun thing to think about while you're looking up at Mars uh, in the night sky. What day is that in Italia? You know off the top of your head? Um, they just said today that it will not be any earlier than April 11th. Okay, because I'm super excited to, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess hear about it, because I guess we won't see the footage necessarily. Maybe Percy will take a picture of its buddy Gene. 
I don't think uh, we're, I don't know. I mean, Percy, Percy or the Perseverance Rover. Sorry, uh, we, we call it Percy for short. Um, we'll probably take a picture of Ingenuity on the surface, but Ingenuity has its own cameras. So what I'm looking forward to is an aerial shot of Perseverance. That's true from too. Ingenuity. Um, it's just also exciting. Uh, it is very, very exciting. This is a brand new technology demonstration. We're gonna fly through the sky of another world for the very first time. It's very cool. Also, Ingenuity is just cute. So that's all going on in the Southwest. I'm gonna swing us around to the North. Can I ask a quick question before we move from the South? Totally can. Um, I think it came in when you were talking about the star clusters and somebody asked, how young is young? Oh, a million years or less. Okay, it's pretty young in the grand scale of the universe, which yeah, is- A million, maybe a million, maybe two million years. You know, again, time scales. 13.4 billion, the universe, is that right? Uh, the universe is 13.8 billion. Point eight. okay. Yeah, so 13.8 yeah, so billion. Our solar system is about 5 billion years old. So our sun is about 5 billion years old. The stars in um, the Pleiades star cluster are only in the millions of years. They're babies. They're babies. All right, so over here in the north um, are some patterns that you've probably heard about. If, you, if you've not seen them before, you've probably heard about them. This is where the dippers live, the big and the little one. So the big one, significantly easier to find. I usually actually need the, to find the Big Dipper to help me find the Little Dipper. Um, the Big Dipper is much brighter and you can sort of see it right here. It's upside down. This is a good time of year to go hunting for the Dipper, for the Big Dipper, because this time of year it's nice and high in the sky at sunset. If you go looking for it in like the fall, it's very, very low to the horizon. So this is actually a better time of year to go hunting for it. But you have one, two, three stars in the handle, and then one, two, three, four stars in the bowl. So it's like a big spoon that you dip in a pot of soup or a pot that you might make the soup in, pot with a bent handle. This is only part of the constellation. The constellation is in fact um, called Ursa Major. It's supposed to be a bear. And I'm always highly amused that somebody looked at that and said, oh yeah, I see a bear. Keep in mind it is upside down, but what do you, what would you call this? If you were, you know, presented with this shape and asked to identify it, whether it's upside down, right side up, sideways, whatever, what would you call it? So I definitely wouldn't call it a bear. It looks like, you know, one of those weird little like air blowy dancing things outside of like car dealerships. <laughs> Nice. Got his hands in the air. Sometimes in different outlines, I think it looks like a rocket ship. This one is a little okay. different uh, than other outlines that I've seen. None of our friends have ideas. Maybe they're just talking about it uh, with people around them instead of typing it into the Q&A, which is A-OK -okay also. Well, that's fine because nothing that you could come up with would be wrong because if this can be a bear, it can be whatever you think it would be. That we got some leaping animals. So a leaping bunny or a leaping deer uh, or an upside down bull. I think our Q&A just must be really delayed today. Our electrons Maybe. are slow. I really like the leaping deer. Actually. Yeah, that's, I just like the word leaping too. Like it feels very spring and like rebirth and fun. Yeah, well, if you're wondering how this is supposed to be a bear, it is in fact a bear with an absurdly long tail. So if you... I mean, maybe We're ancient bear bears there. had really long tails, Talia. Were you around to see them? Um, I was not. I can tell you the story, though, is that this bear has a long tail because it that's how it got thrown into the sky. It actually got thrown by its tail. And in the process, its tail got all stretched out because we all know that's what happens when you pull on a bear's tail. I'll try that at home. Yeah, no, it's, it's not really. I'm pretty sure Karen does the live animal shows. I'm pretty sure she would tell me never to pull on a bear's tail. I would not recommend it. So there is the long-tailed bear, and like I said, 
I use the Big Dipper to find the Little Dipper um, because these two stars right here at the front of the bowl of the Big Dipper, they are sometimes called the pointer stars. Uh, if you draw a line in between them and you extend that line out until you hit a star, you have just found the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, which is also seven stars. And remember I said it's much fainter. So it's one, two, three stars in the handle one, two, three, four stars in the bowl. Now, unlike the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper is a whole constellation. That is the entire constellation. Its constellation name is not Little Dipper. Its constellation name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. So up here we have Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Down here we have Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. And that is because the little bear has an even more stupidly long tail than the big bear does. That's so maybe, more there, maybe, there's, maybe there's just a, a species of long-tailed space bears. Cool. And if you do, in fact, use the Big Dipper to find the Little Dipper, if you do follow those two stars at the front of the bowl, to that star at the end of the handle, you will have not only found the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, you will have found what is probably the most famous star in the sky after the sun, because the end of the handle of the Little Dipper is also Polaris, AKA the North Star. So I'll pull back so you can see where in the sky we're looking here. We are looking right in the North. You can see Polaris is right above the end for North, but that's not the only thing that makes it the North Star. Because if I was to say, look over here, this star is over in the East, but that's not called the East Star. And over here in the West, let's see, this one's over in the West. It's not called the West Star. And that has to do with what happens when the Earth spins. So if I fast forward time, because again, I can do that. The Earth is going to spin because the Earth is always spinning. I'm just going to make it spin faster than normal. You can see things are setting in the west. We swing around to the east, things are rising in the east. So that star we saw in the east earlier is no longer in the east. But Polaris is still in the north. In fact, Polaris is the only star in the sky that isn't really moving. And that is because it actually sits almost perfectly above Earth's North Pole. If you think about, you know, if you're ever in a spinny chair, which I happen to be, if I spin around, everything appears to be moving around me when I spin, except if I look straight up. The point directly above me doesn't appear to move. And Polaris is the point pretty much directly above the Earth. It is almost directly above the North Pole. So as the Earth spins, all the stars appear to move in the sky, except for Polaris. It pretty much stays where it is. So that's why it is so famous. Not because it's super bright or beautiful, but because it's the only star that doesn't really move, which makes it a very handy navigational aid. And so now, if you are ever lost in the woods and you can see the Big Dipper, you can use it to find the North Star and you will still be lost in the woods. But you'll know which way's North, so that's something. Now we are at uh, 3.30 in the morning at this point. The moon has risen. We have a third quarter moon, which means the moon is about three quarters of the way through its uh, orbit around the earth. It's gonna start a new orbit in just about a week uh, and it's rising in the wee hours of the morning. So that's rising again. It's, it's a little after 2 a.m. that it's going to hit the horizon. So, um, it will still be up uh, when the sun rises. It's going to be up for part of the day as well. And if you say, say you're not an evening person, you're really a morning person. You're one of those people who likes to get up really early instead of one of those people who likes to stay up late. I'm personally not one of those people, but I know there are, you are out there. The morning sky actually has some cool things to see as well. So like I said, the moon is going to be rising shortly after 2 a.m. And that means it's going to be really nice and visible from then 
even past sunrise because you can still see the moon in the sky when the sun is up. So the moon's gonna be a good thing to catch in the sky pretty much all day, most of the day. It's gonna set in the afternoon. Uh, and then shortly after 4 a.m., a new bright thing that's going to start to rise over in the east. And that is actually another planet. So Mars is the only planet in the evening sky. Uh, but we have, and then another one right there, we've got two planets rising in the early morning sky. So if you're up before sunrise, look to the east. You'll have a pair of planets that you can spot. And now we've already seen Mars in the evening sky, so we know it's not Mars. There are only five planets that you can see with just your eyes. So without binoculars or a telescope, uh, there's Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And Earth, I suppose. You can just look down and see the Earth. But um, we know Mars is in the evening sky, so this these can't be Mars. These are, in fact, the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. And the brighter one, the one farther to the east, is the planet Jupiter. It makes sense. It's both bigger and closer to us. And then the fainter one that is a little farther west is Saturn. And if you have binoculars or a telescope, they're both worth checking out. Jupiter doesn't take much magnification to get it to show off some of its moons. It's got four big moons that you can see through even a small telescope. And Saturn likes to show off its rings. You can see those through a fairly small telescope as well. Um, it, in fact, 400 years ago, Galileo was able to see both Jupiter's moons and Saturn's rings through his really, really, really bad telescope. Um, he realized those moons were orbiting Jupiter and that was one of the first indications that not everything orbited the Earth, which was a big idea in the 16 tons. And when he saw Saturn's rings, he had no idea what was going on. He thought it looked like the planet had ears because the 1610s were just a weird time. That's one of my favorite stories of Galileo Sat or of Saturn or of both. Saturn has ears. So those are some fun things to check out in the morning sky. If you're looking in the evening sky, look for that ISS pass, look for Mars, look for Orion and Taurus fighting in the Southwest. You can look for the bears in the Northern sky. I hope you'll go out and take a look at any of these. And now if you guys have any questions, I would love to try and answer them. Four. Well, we'll see if any of them come in. We know that our electrons are a little delayed. That is I'll true. Say, personally, Saturn is my favorite planet to look at through a telescope. Um, so if you have the opportunity, um, either yourself or, you know, as the summer and things open up more, you can go to a telescope. It does look amazing um, yeah. in the nighttime sky, seeing those rings. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, we got a question. Is there any constellations only in the middle of the night? Uh, so there's no constellation that will only ever be visible in the middle of the night because what's visible in the middle of the night one month will be visible a little bit earlier in the night the next month and earlier the next month after that because what time of day we see a constellation actually depends on where Earth is in its orbit around the sun. And Earth is always moving, so it's always in a different position. So if you went out in say October and the middle of the night, like wee baby hours of the morning, you would see Orion in the wee baby hours of the morning. If you go out in December, or January, he's in the evening sky, and now he's about to set. So it depends what time of year. Everything uh, changes its rising and setting times as Earth is moving through its orbit. Cool. I have to say, there was one time I was driving my parents to the airport at like three o'clock in the morning in September, and I saw Orion, and it was like a special bonus to get to see Orion that much earlier than normal nighttime hours. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, and we are, sadly, just about out of time. So I want to thank Talia for sharing the sky tonight with us. So you can give a wave. People can give you a virtual thank you. There have been some thank yous coming into the Q&A as well. 
And I'm just going to share my screen again. And I know that we have a lot of regulars. Uh, we appreciate that I see a lot of your names popping up live stream after live stream, week after week. And I do want to make sure that everybody knows this live is going into a pseudo hiatus. There will be a weekly virtual planetarium, our Tuesday program, so about exploring space, thanks to a grant from NASA. So please definitely still keep an eye out for our weekly live stream for virtual planetarium. But these regular Friday Sky Tonight programs are going into slight hiatus as we are educators are quite busy in the museum itself. So if you're local and feel comfortable and have the opportunity to come visit us, we would love to see you at the museum. We have lots of other virtual offerings on our website at MOS at Home. Um, our live streams as they do pop up occasionally will show up there, but we also have a lot of really fun science videos, uh, different activities that you can try out at home with your friends, with your family. So certainly check those out as well. And lastly, if you're able to do so, we always appreciate support so we can keep doing amazing programming uh, as we have been doing for almost 200 years at the Museum of Science. So I wanna thank everybody so much for coming out today. I hope you had fun. I do hope that you guys get out and look for those stars and the planets in the sky tonight. Have a great rest of your Friday and we'll see you at some point. Thanks again, guys.